Hey everyone, welcome back. The U.S. government reopened at the end of the week, and while some parts of NASA continued working without pay throughout that whole time, the rest of the agency is now digging through a six-week backlog of stuff. Thursday was a first day back, but maybe not the first day back for everyone who was furloughed and unpaid, so it still might be another week before we get an update on what happened with Artemis 2, 3, and 4 over the past month and a half. There was some news during that time, including the Artemis 2 full stack, more Artemis 3 and NASA administrator drama, and I got a couple of updates from Artemis contractors that are uh, more at liberty to speak about what they're doing. But there's a lot to catch up on with NASA Public Affairs when they're ready to take questions. For now, Europe and Airbus say that the Artemis IV Orion ESM build is complete and ready to ship. L3 Harris says another RS-25 engine is tested and ready for Artemis V. There's an estimated Starship Artemis III date. And the second New Glenn launch has some relevance here. But first... After six weeks of on-again, off-again, on-again negotiations, Congress finally passed a short-term funding bill for fiscal year 2026 on the evening of Wednesday, November 12th. On this vote, the yeas are 222, the nays are 209. The bill is passed. The motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The bill is a continuing resolution that funds most of the government through January 30th. However, it also includes three so-called regular order appropriations bills, which fund those agencies for the rest of FY 2026. The House of Representatives passed H.R. 5371 back in mid-September, which was a continuing resolution to fund the government through November 21st. But the Senate failed to agree to that bill, with over a dozen procedural votes to end debate, failing in September, October, and early November. Mr. Corn and I. It wasn't until Sunday, November 9th, that 60 senators voted to advance a substitute bill, which is the minimum necessary. On this vote, the yeas are 60 and the nays are 40. Three-fifths of the Senate duly chosen and sworn, having voted in the affirmative, the motion upon reconsideration is agreed to. The House passed CR was amended with a set of compromises between the White House and the Democrats in the minority. It included the new end date for the CR and the three regular order bills, so a minibus. That was finally passed on Monday evening after another series of votes. Yep. On this vote, the ayes are 60, the nays are 40. The bill, as amended, is passed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. And then the House returned to work after staying away for almost two months and passed the bill that the Senate passed. President Trump signed the bill into law Wednesday night, but by that point, passage of the CR was widely anticipated, and NASA had already provided internal guidance to return to work on Thursday, November 13th, as reported by NASA Watch. NASA is not in one of those three regular order bills, so it is only funded through January, essentially. But enactment of funding allows the whole NASA workforce to return to work and everyone to be paid, even those who had to work all six weeks without any pay. There is a considerable workforce that continued to work on Artemis in particular, but almost all of that work was blacked out because almost all of NASA public affairs was furloughed. After six weeks, there's a lot of information on that work that PAO will have to go through. I was able to get a few updates during that period of time from contractors that had already been paid, but we'll have to see how long it takes to catch up on what's been going on. There are obvious questions about the current status of Artemis II launch preparations and imagery of milestones that occurred during the blackout throughout the shutdown. That would include not only Artemis II, but also Artemis III and Artemis IV in some cases. The status of Artemis II would be the highest priority because of that six-week-long blackout. During that time, we did get confirmation that Orion was stacked on SLS, but there was still significant pre-launch processing work and integrated testing to complete. 
Before government funding lapsed, NASA said that a launch period that includes early February was a possibility, and there's about two months left to finish all the work on the vehicle and mobile launcher in the vehicle assembly building before it would need to roll out to launch pad 39B. So one of the first updates we'd ask for is what work has been completed since Orion was stacked, what is the forecast timing for the next milestones, and is there still time to make that window of opportunity in early February, launch period 17? Or has NASA started to look at launch period 18 a month later in early March? On Friday, November 14th, NASA Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs started posting pictures of the final Artemis II stacking operations that occurred in late September and October, but were delayed from publication by the government shutdown. The first was the lift and mate of the Orion stage adapter on September 29th, on the eve of the shutdown. Then, Orion was lifted and mated on October 18th. Additional shots of Orion leaving the launch abort system facility on the evening of October 16th, and then the fully stacked vehicle taken on October 20th, were also published. However, we'll have to wait until next week to get an update on the status of integrated testing and the remaining pre-launch processing of the Artemis II flight hardware. In Artemis III watch this week, or last week, Acting NASA Administrator Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy addressed one of the big questions on the Sean Ryan Show. Following his announcement in the middle of October that Starship HLS was behind schedule and that the agency would look into ways to speed things up, the obvious question was how late Starship is. During his appearance on the show, Secretary Duffy said that SpaceX had recently told NASA that Starship HLS would be more like the end of 2028 than the current official mid-2027 target date. With only three years until the end of 2028, it could be too late to start speeding things up now, so the rhetorical follow-up is how long NASA has known about schedule issues and why wait to do something about it until now. Was it not as important back then? And if so, when did it become this important? This race with China has gotten a lot more publicity recently, but China announced its goal for a crewed lunar landing by 2030 back in 2023. Politicians in Washington have talked about it since before that, but there's been very little in the way of financial commitments from the government or incentives to stay on past or current schedules. Secretary Duffy remains acting NASA Administrator until Jared Isaacman's nomination is confirmed by the Senate, and NASA indicated they are continuing with the HLS Schedule Acceleration Initiatives announced in October. Now that the government is reopening, a request for information will be issued to solicit ideas outside the two HLS providers for a lunar lander that can be ready by the end of 2028. On the Sean Ryan Show, Secretary Duffy also indicated that the agency was going to be making modifications to the HLS contracts for SpaceX and Blue Origin. Those negotiations are also expected now that NASA is funded, at least through January. I'll include a link to the Sean Ryan Show podcast in the description, but it's way better known than this, so I would imagine a lot of you have already seen it. The end of 2028 estimate is still for the crewed lunar landing itself, which is like estimates for an Artemis launch date, pretty vague. We're still missing all the other details that might put any date into perspective. For example, how realistic is end of 2028? We'd need to see the schedule for interim milestones for some context. But there are implications if Starship HLS isn't ready until the end of 2028 beyond the political ones. That date would put it after the official launch dates for both Artemis 3 and Artemis 4, basically delaying both of them unless there are other changes. A couple of questions that follow from this are what options NASA has if that's the case, and are they prepared for those? For example, is NASA prepared for the case that Artemis 2 succeeds in the first quarter of next year? If Artemis 3 now has to wait until the end of 2028 or 2029, there's another three-year-long gap, or thereabouts, between Artemis 2 and 3. Is doing something else still a viable option, or are they just going to have to wait? In the meantime, as I noted in one of the last videos, there's a lot of transition work for EGS, Orion, and SLS between Artemis 3 and 4. 
Some of that can't happen until after Artemis 3 flies. So on the face of it, delaying Artemis 3 until 2029 could delay Artemis 4 into the next decade. Unless something changes, that's going to be another one of the many Artemis questions going into 2026, which is what the plans are for the rest of the decade. Right now, if NASA had other plans, they still have work to do to put other options on the table, beginning with the Artemis 2 flight test to demonstrate that SLS and Orion meet their crew ratings. And we're still going to be following all the Artemis 3 programs and contractors building and testing hardware. NASA hasn't changed the official mid-2027 date, and presumably all the contractors are still working towards delivery dates that reflect that. We're still watching for all the Orion and SLS production milestones, since they are supposed to finish those builds in 2026. And we're still watching the Starship HLS and Axiom EMU development milestones, since they are supposed to complete their critical design reviews next year, and a lot more. If it turns out those delivery dates are relaxed and nothing else changes, that probably signals that NASA has no plans to fly an Artemis mission in 2027. If that's the case, then there's no requirement to name a next Artemis crew to fly a next Artemis mission for the foreseeable future. So Artemis 2 is a big deal, as was Artemis 1, but those two test flights were envisioned as initial stepping stones to operational missions. For over a decade, plans for the missions after what is now called Artemis 1 and 2 were uncertain or doubtful, and right now, with most of the details of the status and schedule for Artemis 3, 4, and beyond hidden from public view, we're back there again, with plans up in the air, but no plans for missions up in the air. In other news and notes, the highest visibility rockets and spacecraft thing of the week was the second New Glenn launch on Thursday, November 13th. On its second flight, the new launch vehicle sent twin 550-kilogram NASA escapade probes on a trajectory that loiters around Earth, as it says here, looping around the Sun-Earth L2 libration point. The trajectory synchronizes a return to the vicinity of Earth at the time of the next Mars transfer window. SpaceX is also targeting that next window for Starship, but these two spacecraft will use a powered flyby of Earth at that time to slingshot them out to Mars. But that took an obvious backseat to the spectacle of landing a reusable rocket stage, with Blue Origin recovering their GS-1 first stage on a barge downrange. After touchdown, the stage fired anchors into the deck to physically secure itself. That's all maybe not directly relevant to Artemis for this specific launch, but like Starship launches, which aren't yet directly relevant to Artemis, New Glenn is a key element of Blue Origin's lunar landing architecture for NASA's HLS program. The Blue Moon Cislunar Transporter and Mark II Lander that will land astronauts on the moon on Artemis V are launched and refueled by New Glenn tankers. New Glenn also launches the uncrewed Mark I cargo lunar lander, which is also rumored to be a part of an architectural concept that NASA might explore for landing astronauts on the moon for Artemis III, based on some stated and unstated technical and political assumptions. The first flight of the Mark I spacecraft is still planned for next year. If so, New Glenn could be in Artemis news in 2026 and possibly play a bigger role next year. Somewhat like SpaceX and their Starship system in development, Blue Origin is looking to increase the launch cadence for New Glenn to be able to support multi-launch Earth orbit and lunar orbit rendezvous concepts. On Monday, November 10th, the European Space Agency and prime contractor Airbus announced that standalone production of the fourth European service module for Orion, ESM-4, was complete and it was ready to be boxed for shipment to the Kennedy Space Center. ESM Flight Model 4 will support the Artemis 4 lunar landing mission. Completion of ESM 4 by Airbus at their Assembly, Integration, and Test Facility in Bremen, Germany comes about 15 months after completion of ESM 3, which shows that they are making progress towards the goal of delivering one unit every 12 months. For reference, ESM 2 was completed in October 2021, and before that, the first European service module was completed in November 2018. Airbus is already working on the 5th and 6th flight model units, and negotiations were in progress for three more after that. 
However, there is more uncertainty about the future of the Orion program this year after the White House proposed termination after Artemis III. Although Congress subsequently funded the current Artemis architecture through Artemis V, it remains unclear who will be paying for future ESM units, and what possible changes there might be with the future of Orion less clear. In response to the threat of cancellation and termination officially announced by the White House back in May, overall Orion Prime contractor Lockheed Martin started looking at the possibility of converting the government program into a commercial service. For now, ESM-4 still needs to be transported from Bremen to KSC to begin integration with the rest of the Artemis IV Orion elements. The ESM for that build is likely the farthest along in production, with the Artemis III build being Lockheed Martin's highest Orion priority. In part due to the termination threat after Artemis III, it became even more difficult to get any updates on the status of any Orion hardware after that. Although we've seen imagery of the crew module and the crew module adapter structures for Artemis IV, and Congress has seemingly taken termination off the table, we have been unable to get any responses to questions about details of the status of production for going on a year. At a high level, what would happen next is the ESM would be integrated with the crew module adapter. Those are the two major elements of the Orion service module. We don't know how close the CMA is to being ready for that mate, though. And then eventually the service module would be integrated with the crew module. But similarly, we don't know how far into the build that Artemis IV element is either. On Wednesday, November 12th, RS-25 engine prime contractor L3 Harris and the NASA Stennis Space Center hot-fired engine 20002. The engine is the second flight engine build in the RS-25 production restart program and now that it has been acceptance tested, it will be inspected and then eventually put in storage for eventual use as an SLS core stage engine on Artemis V. In contrast to development engines that are used for more frequent ground testing, the flight engines are typically only fired on the ground once before flight use. The SLS core stage is used like the Space Shuttle Orbiter was during launch, as a ground-started sustainer stage that runs through orbital insertion. For SLS, a 500 second firing mimics a full duty cycle from 6 seconds of runtime pre liftoff through main engine cutoff. I recently got a program update from L3 Harris on the RS 25, building new flight engines for Artemis 5 through Artemis 9, but also supporting launch of the existing RS 25 adaptation engines for Artemis 2 through Artemis 4. The link to that video is in the upper right, and I'll also put that in the description. The government was still shut down at the time of the test on Wednesday afternoon, which meant that this was the second RS-25 test in a row that was blacked out from the public. We'll be watching to see if and when a full recording of the test is made available. L3 Harris is contracted to deliver 24 new engines to NASA and its SLS program, and has dozens of units in production. The engines are manufactured at the component level in facilities in California and Florida, and then final assembly is done at Stennis in southern Mississippi. The kit to assemble the third flight engine is already at Stennis, and assembly of the powerhead is already far along. The plan was to test three more flight units next year, which would cover the Artemis V set. The first four new engines will also serve as the backups for Artemis IV, and L3 Harris is ramping up production to support NASA's initial goal of one SLS launch per year. Thanks as always for watching. Like and subscribe if you find these videos informative and want to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. As usual, a big thanks to members of this YouTube channel who are helping to make it possible to keep doing these videos. I am posting additional content, including more videos and other posts during the week if you're interested in joining. If you're willing to make a one-time donation to support what I do, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me A Coffee page in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.